Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to our wellness podcast and my today's guest is an amazing surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Lina Zanauskas. Hi everyone. So tell our viewers just a little bit information about yourself. So as again you've heard, my name is Linas, I'm from Lithuania, lived here, was born here and hope to end here. And talking about my career as a surgeon, so I started uh, 15 years ago. Uh, most of the time I was well, dedicated to the orthopedic surgery. For the last seven years, I exclusively, uh, exclusively uh, am interested in total hip and knee replacement, not only primary, but also revision hip replacement and knee. And my career, why it well, shifted towards orthopedics, uh, maybe one thing was that I was quite active as a child. I had a lot of well, unfortunate injuries. I had to deal with the orthopedic surgeons. And sometimes it was pleasant, sometimes it was not. So maybe it made me to look forward to the speciality to become one that could help the other patients and the same as I was once and to give them the care that they need. So this is my just journey, how it started, and I hope that it will end also nicely. <laughs> <laughs> so, doctor, did, uh, did you uh, were you involved in professional sports, or you were just a naughty kid no, climbing was, trees and, and stuff? <laughs> it started with the with the dumb stuff that was done in the very young age. Afterwards, yeah, it was basketball because of the heights, but but at some time the height stopped, so it was not did not reach the professional heights and. Yeah, a lot of traumas also came from the basketball to the ankles, to the hip, and and so on. But yeah, probably it's because of the active young, young full age. Yeah. So now the the tables have turned, and you are helping uh, for people. Yeah. So I can relate to them. Yeah. So when they say <laughs> I feel pain, yeah, I can feel your pain because I was in that situation, so I had this one. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is why I can be more. Uh, feel more empathy to the patient because I know how he feels like and what care he expects to get and how he wants to return to the movement and, and to his daily life activities. Let's talk about normal hip anatomy and how does a normal hip work? Yeah, normal hip works like uh, it's a ball in a socket joint. Mm -hmm. So we have two parts. Unfortunately, I can show just one. It's the pelvis part uh, that has the acetabulum inside. The other part is the femur. It has like a ball-shaped head that goes inside the acetabulum. So during the range of motion of the movement of the hip, it moves around. It's held by various structures. One is the uh, ligamentum teres that holds the head inside. Others are capsule, ligaments and muscles that keep the ball in place. So in native joint, it's hard to dislocate the hip itself, which can happen in the, after the surgery when we talk about the complications. But, but again, usually it happens after some trauma or something else. But the joint itself, like I mentioned, it's a ball and socket, it's a large joint, and unfortunately it, sometimes it gets illness or disease like osteoarthritis, a vascular necrosis, post-traumatic arthritis, and sometimes we have to deal with it with the surgery itself, total joint replacement. So let's talk uh, semantics. Is it hip replacement or hip joint replacement or can it be both? It can be both. Sometimes you can hear total joint arthroplasty of the hip. There are other words that can describe it. The procedure itself, it replaces the joint. Some people understand incorrectly when we talk about joint replacement, they think that we cut off the bone, the segment of the bone, the segment of the femur, but it's not so invasive it's much more or less invasive. So we just remove the cartilage or damaged bone on, uh, on the side of the acetabulum. We will put implants, we'll show a bit later. Yeah. And on the other side, we cut the neck of the femur and we place inside the bone other component, the femoral component. And afterwards, the joint acts like, like an native joint, a ball and socket. So it goes inside and it moves around. It so looks really cool. This is the cool. principle how it, how it works. It looks really modern and really, really cool. I can't believe that you put this into your body and you are like, like a transformer, a very cool new person. Yeah. Yeah. Transformers. No, maybe more Terminator. Terminator. Oh, that's way cooler. 
<laughs> so you can do loads of cool stuff. So you mentioned uh, several conditions um, uh, which are main causes for, for the, the reason why you replace hips for, for people. Can we go one by one and just to uh, introduce them to our patients? So uh, one by one. So osteoarthritis, what is the mechanism? Yeah, this, this is thing? the degenerative joint disease. It means it usually comes after some time of, of illness and it affects elderly people but it can be caused by, for example, underlying conditions like hip dysplasia or, or previous microtomas and so on. And the joint become, becomes degenerative after repetitive, well, after some years because of repetitive movement of, of some changes inside the hip. And it usually affects from 55, 65 to up to 80 and 90 years old patients. And patients can feel quite well with this kind of disease if they do not feel pain. They can have limited range of motion, but they say, oh, I don't feel any pain, so it's, it's not bothering me in everyday life activities. So the surgery usually comes after a couple of years or 10 years after the initial diagnosis. Oh, so okay. this is much mild, mild disease that takes quite some time to just be recognized and treated. Second most popular condition? I would not call it popular, yeah, it's... it's a disease that usually affects all of the body is rheumatoid arthritis and usually the patients know that they have this condition quite some also time before the the stage that the disease takes part of the joints it's inflammatory disease, uh, disease it affects usually small joints like the hands and so on but after some time it can also damage larger joints like knee elbow shoulder hip or even the ankle and sometimes these patients need also hip replacement, but in their case, it's a bit more difficult because of the systemic response of the disease. So they take medical drugs that affect the immune system, so sometimes they are more prone to infection. This is one case. Another thing is that they have a bit of lesser bone quality. So in that case, in those cases, we have to take account it, accounts into it and try to decide whether we use one type of implants like cemented fixation or uncemented and try to achieve, well, again, the best outcomes. But we have to take, take care and to think in our heads much broader picture. Because mm -hmm. these patients have other lying conditions that we need also to take, well, to address them. A post-traumatic arthritis. Yes. Uh, this one usually affects younger patients. Oh. And as the word itself says, it's post-traumatic usually. The trauma itself, it's not a minor trauma that you slipped on the floor and just did uh, some unusual movement. Usually it happens when the patient sustains high energy trauma. Usually it's a motor vehicle accident, fall from heights and so on. So they can get fractures of the, like this bone, acetabulum, or they can get fractures on the femoral head, which is less common, but usually it's femoral neck fractures. They initially go treatment with the osteosynthesis, it means that the broken bones are fixed, reduced and fixed with some metal hardware, like plates, nails, screws and so on. Mm -hmm. But after some time, the joint can get degenerative disease like arthritis, but it's post-traumatic. Why, why does it happen? Because at the initial trauma, usually the cartilage suffers also. But we cannot deal with it and it takes much lesser time for it to degenerate. So. And another case is when we have poorly reduced fractures or non-anatomical reduction and the treatment itself can fail. So in those cases, we can even do it much earlier and help the patients to get on their legs and try to, to be mobile as possible, as quick as possible. So hip replacement is not only for elderly, what no. I'm hearing. No. So you have uh, patients uh, of various ages, yeah? The youngest one was... 25, I guess, oh, but so I know even younger. more younger ones, but we can we do not mention here that there is an oncology section where we have even young children that need replacement and they, well, they get the growing prosthesis or other types, but again, they also can have pursuits. Yeah. And it was as early as 16 years old, 14 years old. So the next uh, name of the disease has something to do with bones and dying of the bones. Yeah, it's osteonecrosis. Osteonecrosis, yeah. To simplify 
the condition it's like you have a heart uh, stroke it's the same you have disrupted blood supply to the bone the bone itself dies and it collapses so again usually it's without a cause we cannot find it so it's idiopathic it's about to 90 percent of the cases are systematic systemic diseases which require glucocorticosteroids systemic smoking abusive drug use and alcohol use and 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 probably that's it the other 90 percent of the cases it's just idiopathic the patient comes in it's quite young ones they are from 30 to 40 years old they have sudden onset of pain the leg length discrepancy is stay is uh, shows itself very quickly mm -hmm. so the leg is shortening the head is collapsing and the pain itself it's it's very serious it's not going away even with the narcotic analgetics and in these cases we have to perform the surgery surgery uh, well, as soon as possible did i manage to collect all uh, cases where patients yeah these are the main cases so the sometimes cases. they have patients can for example get surgeries like arthroscopic surgeries of the hip they can get uh, complications infections and so on so uh, these are the cases but it's just below one percent main of the diseases yeah it's osteoarthritis rheumatoid arthritis post-traumatic arthrosis and osteonecrosis okay this come up to 98 percent of the case how important it is to replace a hip as soon as possible how long can you delay the surgery well the question is also it comes back to the diagnosis yeah, if yeah, you yeah. have osteoarthritis that it's a long taking disease and you are well able to cope with it so you do not feel pain you do not feel any restrictions in your daily activities so you can live with it everything's okay and when you become unable to do some certain things and it tries, starts to bother you or otherwise if you're feeling more and more pain and the analgetics are not giving any effect so this is the case when you should be offered Otherwise, the life don't, gives you, don't give you any joy anymore, so you're, you're mad at your relatives and everything around because you're in constant pain and you're unable to do your daily chores. Other diseases like osteonecrosis or post-traumatic arthritis, they develop much more quickly. And in those cases, you can get bony defects or, or, or surrounding tissue defects much quickly, so we try to avoid it, so we do not postpone the surgery on those patients. We try to talk with them, try to explain what will happen if you wait too long, and we try to make the decision together. Mm -hmm. But the same is also for osteoarthritis. If you have serious changes, but sometimes the pain is it's still manageable, you have to talk to the patient and remind, it, remind him that after some years, if your leg length shortening becomes, well, more than two centimeters, if your bony defects will take into account and they will be much larger, so then we will need additional implants additional time and they will be with additional risks of complications so just to postpone as safe well as possible for the shortest duration otherwise we do not try to, to say the patients will go out for the 10 years and then come back and we'll see if you need one what kind of preparation is needed for hip replacement surgery in terms of uh, medications uh, testing moving uh, furniture at home because when you are back at home maybe you have to keep in mind that you will have to make some adjustments uh, losing weight time of work just walk us through the process of preparation okay, and uh, sorry doctor mm -hmm. keep in mind that i'm talking only about our foreign patients not about yeah, our okay, little so so the first thing is the medication usually the medication that you take it's okay you have to continue it because it's the underlying conditions that you have to keep managing uh, the only case is when you use blood thinners anticoagulants mm -hmm. so depending on which type do you use sometimes we have to discontinue them for for two days up to five days well it's depending on the medication and why it's prescribed for but again usually two days after that we continue them and everything's okay other medications except those that are used for rheumatoid arthritis so they are different and we have to check if it's safe to continue them or we have to stop them because of the uh, increased risk of infection.
So, but again, it's individual. But doctor, who is responsible for managing this uh, med medication situation? So the uh, the person comes to, I don't know, his general practitioner. He says that you need a consult with ortho, then a surgery. So who's the one to explain how this works? So general practitioner would not do it. It's The main thing is that the GP would give the information to the clinic or to the surgeon. Okay. And not to forget that these disease and those uh, medications are, well, relevant. So this is the main thing. Afterwards, mm -hmm. we, will, we will see, we will ask, and there's a questionnaire that you fill out. And if we see if there's a, a question marks, so we take a closer look at it and we solve. Okay. So this is about medication. Blood tests, usually there's routine blood tests, whole blood count, uh, com well, complete blood count, some biochemics, uh, uh, biochemic testing, and for the blood thinning. Mm -hmm. So these are the mains, a, a electrocardiogram or ACG, it's also all mandatory. So it's and done like a week prior to the surgery? Up or? to 10 days. Up to 10 days. Yeah, usually we, we say it's 10 days before or it's the same day that you come in. But again, if you do not have any underlying serious diseases, usually blood and other tests are good. So it can be taken even, well, two to three days before mm -hmm. the surgery. Okay. Uh, another important thing, it, these are the x-rays. Mm -hmm. For example, if we have x-rays before the surgery, so we can plan it. So if the patient comes without an x-ray, of course, we do them here. We try to, well, to standardize it and to, to, to plan the surgery. But it's better, for example, for me to have it in a week's notice and so on, so I can do the planning without any stresses and to see the backup plans and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is the testing. About adjustments at home, well, there are a couple of things, depending on the, again, surgical approach which would be used. But for instance, in the posterior approach, we recommend not to bend the knee upwards, bend the hip more than 90 degrees for six weeks. So we have to have these sitting, well, heights that would not exceed this angle of degree, but usually Standard chairs, beds, and so on are fine. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about other stuff, these are the, for example, carpets that if they have their edges upward cur mm. curled, so try to avoid those because if you walk, you can trip on it and fall. So try to, to, to take to account also and try to remove them or just try to make them straight that you won't be, well, endangered in yourself. Mm -hmm. And other things, well, you know your home, so you know every bit of it, so it's much easier to navigate at home than at a nursing facility or in the hospital because it's new to you. And the home, it's, well, it's all to you. You know every inch of it, so it's, it usually doesn't, does not make any problems. Okay. And when can you expect uh, going back to work? I think, it, I believe it, it depends on, on a job yeah. you do, <laughs> literally. For example, yeah, if you're working in office, so it's, it's much easier to go back. So you can have even if you're not comfortable in sitting for, for longer time, so you can have tables up and keep standing and so on. Uh, the other thing is the construction site. Some, some patients get their hips done and they go back to the construction. So. For some, it takes up to six weeks mm -hmm. for more hard labor because those six weeks are the initial ones just for wounds to heal and the deep muscles to heal. So six weeks, I would recommend to avoid a hard labor. Afterwards, you just increase your work and your physical activity gradually. Mm -hmm. Not that one day, oh, six weeks went past, so I will jump with the chute out of the, out of the plane. So it's, it's, it's not how it works. Okay. Let's uh, move to the operating theater. So the patient uh, is laying on the table. And my first question is regarding the whole process, which type of anesthesia is used on a patient? Usually it's spinal anesthesia. Mm -hmm. It means from the waist down, the patient cannot feel anything or move their legs. And other premedication is given just not to hear the noises that are happening through the surgery not to be and disturbed they are and with the, with the anxiety so the anesthesiologists perfectly deal with it and the patients well i can give you an example of myself because i had surgery so you just see how you're going to the or mm -hmm. so hello hello we will do the spinal you just shut your eyes you wake up oh i'm in my bed mm -hmm. after the surgery so nothing mm -hmm. 
What kind of implants and components do you use? I see... So, yeah, there are, the type of implants can be divided in some certain, well, categories. Mm -hmm. The first thing is that we do total hip, not a partial one. There is an option of a partial hip, but a partial hip usually it's for the femoral neck fracture patients or the other bone preserving procedures like resurfacing. Well, it was done in previous years. Now it's, it's, it's amount is decreasing and, and because of other issues, we try not to do it, mm -hmm. we do not do it. So other thing is the fixation of the implants. So we have two type of fixation. If we have good bone quality, we use the uncemented implants in the femoral side and on the acetabular side. Mm -hmm. So they are made of metal, usually titanium, that has the best compatibility with the human bone uh, because of the elasticity and other pro uh, um, technical issues. They are covered with special material that enhances ingrowth of the bone. So we have to prepare the bone, insert them with some force just mm -hmm. to keep it in place. Afterwards, it grows around or into the metal, depends again on the implant and it stays in place. Uh, the same for the acetabulum, so we have also the same coating. We prepare the acetabulum, we impact it and it stays in place. If we achieve good bone, we have good bone quality and we achieve good fixation, we do not need any additional screws. In some cases, revision cases, these post-traumatic or osteonecrosis cases when we have softer bone and so on, sometimes we have to use acetabulum with holes, then the holes, those holes are made for additional screw fixation. It means that we put screws into the bone just to keep the mm. implant in place. And it's for the primary stabilization of the implant. It's the mechanical one. After a couple of weeks, the bone starts just to getting inside on or on top of the implant. And the bio bio biological fixation is achieved. So it means it's just bonded with your bone and it's probably for your life. Is there any way to demonstrate how this it's, puzzle works on this? It's, yeah, we would have to have additional instruments just to ream outside the acetabulum, but otherwise it goes inside. We have to impact it with a brutal force, quite brutal here. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not fitted because it's not the diameter that the acetabulum is. So during the surgery, we have bone milling machine, not milling machine, but a reaming machine. Mm -hmm. So we just ream the bone to the diameter of the acetabulum. When we see that it's enough, we take the exact size and we put inside. And you use a lot of force, I've seen that. It's not maximum force. Well, it has to be controlled, otherwise you can have fractures. So yeah. you have to bear it in mind and to, to know how hard to strike. Okay, so this one goes in here, yeah. and then what? And this is the case, for example, maybe this is not the right thing to show, just how it should look like inside the bone. Okay. But the other case is when we have the original one. This is a much larger one. It's a sample, so we would have... It won't it would fit, be but a, it's just a, a demonstration. A with a size of, for example, it has everything written on it, so it's size 16. Mm -hmm. And we would dream with 59 or 16 that we would implant the acetabular cup when it's in safe position. So we have the inlay or acetabular liner, which acts as a, as the bearing surface with the head. So this is the case. So afterwards, we put a femoral stem mm -hmm. inside the femur. We, we take the head, we impact it on the femoral side. So the, we have one part, this is the femur, and we have the acetabulum. So we uh, achieve reduction of the joint, and that's it. So the muscles and capsule is holding everything together. Jo the joint can move up to 155 degrees of motion. So it's 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 substantial amount and it's quite enough. And sometimes we have additional features on the acetabular side, like this roof, for example, when we use it in the posterior approach. So it helps us to do, to diminish or reduce the dislocation rate up to, to zero more less than zero. So it's it's comparable to other approaches like anterior that everyone says that it's the best because of the dislocations, but otherwise, when you do the surgery correctly, the risk of complications, it's the same depending on the approach. So we have this movement. Mm -hmm. And other cases when we have poor bone quality, but it's, well, usually in the early elderly patients or the rheumatoid arthritis patients, so we have these polished stems that we use. 
and we filled the canal of the femur with the cement and afterwards we put inside the stem and wait for the cement to cure and it usually takes up to 10 to 12 minutes. Is so, this a literal concrete cement? Yeah. No, it's like the same, quite the same that are used in the teeth. Oh, this yeah. kind so, of cement. Yeah. So, so <laughs> few. It, no, it's yeah, it has antibiotics in it and so on. So sometimes we can play with the stem position and so on. It's it's again, it's not uh, inferior fixation, mm -hmm. but it's well, it's a better choice for some patients. Oh, okay. So we also use sometimes, and we have extreme cases. Sometimes it's better to use even cemented than the the uncemented. Mm -hmm. So it's not mandatory, but but again, we take into account the patient, his disease, his all status, and then we decide what to do. And the last call is during the surgery. If we see if everything's not how it's supposed to be, so we switch and we do the best for the patient. How long does the surgery take? Well, with the preparation, with the anesthesia and so on, it takes about two hours. The surge itself, if it's uncemented one, if it's not the hardest case or with the defects and so on, it takes about 45 to one hour, mm -hmm. 45 minutes to one hour. Uh, how does things look at the first 24 hours after the surgery for the patient in terms of feeling uh, and everything, yeah. pain? And first four, four hours, it's just the spinal just stays in place, so you do mm. not feel any pain, you do not move your legs, you can be a bit dizzy because of the pre-medication. Afterward, patients get prescribed uh, an analgetic uh, course mm -hmm. or protocol, multimodal analgesia course, just for a couple of days to stay without pain. It's not that the patient, we do not give them any medications and they wait until the pain goes up. This is not our goal. Our goal is to keep the patient under the pain threshold that he would be able to move quite early and quite comfortable. Because a physio, uh, like six hours after the surgery, the physio yeah. comes and hello. When, yeah, when the spinal wears off, so nice to meet you. Stand up. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> You're literally laying in your bed after the surgery and the physio is like, let's test drive your yeah. new hip. <laughs> is that safe, yeah. doctor? Yeah, it's safe because, like I mentioned, the hip itself, well, all the muscles all around hold it together. It's just some movements, that extreme movements that could cause some changes in it. But again, we test it during the surgery. For example, we usually use our hip. We do not flex it then more than 120 degrees. Mm -hmm. During the surgery, we flex the, the knee or the hip up to the, almost the head into other side, into extreme rotations. We see if there's any impediment, if we can do anything better. So these movements do not occur, uh, occur in a healthy individual on daily basis. Yeah. So these are the extreme movements. Mm -hmm. So some, yeah, sometimes things happen, but, but it's, it's, it's very rarely. Is it true that uh, the hip replacement surgery is, uh, I don't know if, if the term is correct, but slightly wasted if you do not uh, follow a physiotherapy journey after that? Well, well how important is physiotherapy? For the patient, it's, well, it's substantial. From the other side of the government, like in some cases, I know in some countries, they did not provide the physio for, for a couple of days or even a week after the surgery. It's much harder for them. But in our case and in, in other countries, they provide with the physio after the surgery. So the patients will feel more confident. They learn, they do, they know how they should should or how they are supposed to act and this makes their journey through this surgery much easier it's not just us just to to save the money it's well it's the patient mm -hmm. he has you have to do the first thing right and and afterwards you won't have any problems if, if something happens well then you have to pay much more money and the patient is dissatisfied and so on so well i think five days up to ten days it's okay during the physiotherapy, okay, the physiotherapist is teaching the patient how to get up from the bed, how to walk, how to move and stuff. What is there to learn? Like, do I forget how to walk or get up? No, the pain itself, yeah, it kicks in. At some point, you have to 
learn how to do it correctly in the first stages because sometimes, yeah, that group of patients, let's say, I'm fine, thanks, he steps up and goes in his own way and, and he's perfectly fine. Otherwise, when you become more elder and the surgery is done on elderly patients, even a day in a bed or two days in a bed, well, it eats your muscles, I can say. For example, if you lay in the bed for one week without moving, mm -hmm. the first thing that we, you will lose is your muscles because it's mm. the part that will be taken by the body just to keep alive, uh -huh. stay alive. So it's important to go and to make the patient move as early as possible. And sometimes in more elderly, elderly patients or maybe obese patients and so on, they have maybe they will not have such motivation as a younger one because they need to get back on their feet to jobs and, and so on. This is one case. Another thing is that they are maybe not able to do on their own because of the surge itself, because there's a cut inside your body, it's a skin, it's, it, the hip was dislocated, cutted, the knee was also bent and they feel some pain elsewhere. So they need to learn how to stay relaxed, not tightened all the way because it also increases the pain, how to move around, how to do everything right. Because also elderly patients after the surgery, they can sometimes get with the delirium a bit, mm -hmm. it's conscious status that they are not aware of where they are, why they are there and so on. Yeah. So this is a complex issue and yes, for the younger ones that are fully healthy, that are well strong enough, yeah, they can go home right away. Mm -hmm. But otherwise it's much safer for, for those patients that need this type of, of recovery just to stay in place. It's like I said, it's not for two to three weeks that yeah, it's too much. You don't need that time. But the first stages up to one week, it's complementary to them and they truly feel better. Yeah, I know that, well, your elderly patients, I'm talking about last three, uh, I did um, interviews with uh, Margaret, Candy, and also Clara. They were in a severe, severe, severe pain. Before. And, yeah, before. Before, yeah. Yeah, and after the surgery, they are saying the same day, the pain is off. Yeah, this is the difference again when we have the patients that have waited for a substantial amount of time with a debilitating pain, nothing is helping, they have their condition well far beyond that should have been solved before. Mm -hmm. So they are in serious pain and you just take away the cause. So that's it. So the incision pain itself and the surgery pain itself, it's not comparable to that pain that they had before. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, oh, okay, it's not the pain, it's just itching, I just want to scratch my buttocks and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. For other patients, when they have other diseases like the, for example, rheumatoid arthritis or post-traumatic arthritis, well, when sometimes they're doing quite fine and you do the surgery that requires quite of dissection because, for example, uh, material removal after the trauma that was synthesized and so on, some, or to some extent that the surgery becomes itself more invasive. So mm -hmm. sometimes they can feel their pain a bit more on the higher level and for the longer periods. So, and other cases that every patient is different. Mm -hmm. Some patients do not feel anything at all. Some patients still feel pain for, for a couple of weeks. But the main thing is that the pain, well, again, from, <laughs> from, from experience, the pain is worse on the second post-operative day, if mm -hmm. it is. And afterwards it decreases mm -hmm. because the first day is the analgesia that we give also during the surgery inside the joint so the first day the first post-op day they are great they're doing fine they're walking everything's good the second day ah, i don't feel so good <laughs> because the pain is kicking in but you just try to remind that well it's okay we give you more meds just try to see how you're dealing with it and when you do go day after day you just ask them, how is your pain now oh it's still pain well, how do you compare it with yesterday? Oh, it's, it's, it's much better, much better. Mm -hmm. And every day it has to decrease. So this is the main thing. 
Actually, it's a bit emotional and a bit beautiful, especially for me, because I am uh, often sit with these patients and doing an interview, you know, for wellness travels. So I get to hear the full uh, story of, of their disease and this and that. And uh, every time I ask the, these lovely elderly ladies, um, so what do you think about the surgeon? They all are, they are pain free for, I don't know, after like three years of excruciating pain. It's, and the pain is was always there with them. It's not like the pain uh, is with you when you are only moving. They're, they're yeah. laying on their bed and stuff. So they're like, oh, the surgeon is very handsome. And yeah, because you know what? After, you know, um, being finally free from the pain, you start noticing colors. Uh, handsome men, uh, the surroundings, everything, because um, the life is is completely new and you forget about. Yeah, because like I mentioned, well, the patient has it always. It's the problem when he has or she has it, the pain at night. This is when it comes even more bothering. You cannot do yeah. daily activities and you cannot get any sleep. You wake up and oh good damn, again, my hip, my knee and so on. Mm -hmm. So they get frustrated very quickly, and when you take it away, this is well, it's amazing. So yeah. Yeah. how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they do not see you know your years of medical training and no. this and that, but it, that but you give the the most important but, thing. Like, but the question is well, not the question. The the situation is that they well gives give the confidence to you and they believe in you and they come here just well they're desperate i yeah. think that they would seek help well in their own country because it would be much more not maybe not pleasant but convenient just to stay around the house somewhere yeah, near. familiar environment yeah, and, and so but but the situation dictates itself so they seek help abroad well and we try to help them the same yeah. way we try to help everyone yeah, yeah, and it's really lovely. And uh, best wishes to Clara, Margaret, and Candy if you're yeah, watching. <laughs> yeah. So, when um, can a patient expect full recovery after the surgery, like as if nothing ever happened, or is there ever? No, maybe the the term itself is uh, uh, incorrect. Well, the main goal is to just to come back to your life that you had before. It mm -hmm. does not mean that if we change your hip, that you will start, I don't know, running marathons and so on. But you so can So if though. you had, yeah, you can do it, but well, again, it's putting stress on the implant. You can do it, but I do not disencourage doing something. There are just a couple of things that I try to say, try to avoid well, contact activities, highly contact, like don't play rugby because otherwise you can get the hit in your leg and you can dislocate it. Mm -hmm. uh, don't jump with parachutes, well, mm -hmm. again, because of the poor landing. Otherwise, you can also damage your hips, knees, whatever. So, but it puts you in risk because of the of dislocation and periprosthetic fractures because you have this thing inside. And don't try to do squats with your with weights. Mm. So it means like, putting your joint into extreme movement. You can do it, but on your own risks. You understand that you can have it. It does not mean that you will dislocate or anything else. Yeah. Just try to keep in mind that you had something done with you. It's not your native joint. You can try to push your limits to see how it's going. If you feel well, if you do not feel any discomfort, do it. So this is why we do the surgery, just to go back to your day, daily activities or life that you had before. Yeah. So, for the elderly, that usually just try to keep active, hike, and so on. So, it's about well, six weeks, three months, I guess, just to come back to the, mm -hmm. to the level that they had before. For the more active patients, maybe it can take a bit more time because they really want something more. So, just daily activities, hiking, moving, bikes, swimming, it's up to three months, but heavy labor, not labor, heavy sports or, or trying to sport competitive sports like basketball. Some of them try to play football and so on. So it might take a bit more time just to develop muscles, again, muscles around the joint that it will stabilize it and it will, you will feel comfortable just doing it. Mm -hmm. But it's not like, oh, no, no, you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do it. It's titanium. You can do a lot of things with it. I yeah, believe. but the problem is that 
this usually does not break. Something around it breaks. It's your bones that are oh. not titanium. So this is one thing. And Good the dislocation, point. because otherwise, like I told, the natural head of the hip, it has a ligament mm -hmm. that is from here up to here. So it always keeps, and the size of the head is much larger. Why we use this size heads, it's 36, it's quite large. It's to reduce the dislocation rate. As smaller you get, the more chance of dislocating. So as large as possible, we put it inside, but we do not have the ligament, so we can move it. So this is why you need six weeks, all the muscles, all the ligaments and, and the capsule to heal around it. Afterwards, you can do those range of, those activities and that range of motion. How different is the whole path for a patient and the story if you need both your hips uh, being replaced? Can I, you do this at I, the same time? Yeah, it, it's sometimes it can be done. But again, you have, you have to have the uh, patient itself that should be quite healthy. And you have to have conditions that require both bilateral hip replacement. Because on the simple, simple explanation though, this, this procedure, bilateral hip replacement, it can, well, it has a high risk of complications. Mm -hmm. Because you have two surgeries on the same patient. And if something goes wrong with one side, so you don't even have the quite healthy other side. So the question is how it will go afterwards. And, and, and there is literature that shows that you can do it. Well, you can do it in some population of the patients. I have been in one case where we performed bilateral, mm -hmm. but it was the case when the patient could not even bend his hip. So it means he was walking just straight up if he needed to lie down, mm -hmm. he just would go up to the bed and just drop to the bed. Oh my so goodness. So because he could not sit anymore. Mm -hmm. And this was the case when you cannot do one side because one side will flex, other will not, and his rehab will be impaired. So then was the decision made just to do bilateral. But again, all the risks were taken into account. The patient, there was explanation to a patient and so on. If the patient has both sides damaged, but quite substantial amount of movement and the pain is bearable, so just go with one side, go through the rehab, through the uh, healing process, everything's fine, we go to the other side and that's it. Mm -hmm. So it's much, in my opinion, it's much safer for the patient. But again, in some certain cases, yes, it's a case when you can perform. How long does this uh, implant last? Do you need to change it after time? This question, well, it's regarding revision surgery. It means that repetitive surgery has to, has to be performed for the hip. Uh, nowadays, we try to explain the patients what is your risk to have revision surgery at some point at your life. Because if you look at all the literature, it shows that this implant, for example, has a survival rate of 10 years up to 99%. So it means one out of 100 will need a revision. But again, which one? So mm -hmm. no one knows. These implants, themselves, they last a lot of time. When we talk about implant-related things, so we can have such complications as dislocation, uh, loosening, or osteolysis, and, and maybe a fracture of implant, but it's very rare. The other complications can be such as infection, which is much more, well, it's difficult to manage it and so on, but, but it's not really related to the implant itself. It's because of the patient, the surgical technique and so on. So, revision rate, quite low. But the patient, for example, when the patient comes in 50 years old and 85 years old, so they have different revision risks. The one that is 50, well, again, depends if you're male or female. If you're a male in your 50s, your risk of revision through your lifetime, you don't need to live 100 years or 150, through your lifetime would be about 30%. So, substantial amount. But if your surgery is performed at 65, you will only have 15% revision. Probability. It's not, it does not mean that you will have your hip revised, it's just probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and for females, it's, it's a lesser well, percentage. 
because of their work that they are doing more sedentary life and so on. The males, well, they do stupid stuff. So <laughs> they tend to yeah, do. They tend to do it, and and well, sometimes bad things happen with the hips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dr. Linus, would you like to add something um, before the ending of our podcast? Or did we cover everything? Well, well not everything, yeah, it's cannot, impossible, you know, but... We uh, cannot cover anything because we can touch on the approaches, on, on the implants itself. We can, for example, if there would be another orthopedic setting, you can argue till death and, well, nothing will be clear and, and so on. Yeah. So this is one thing. The simple thing is, if you have a condition that requires hip replacement, again, try not to delay it as much as possible. Just you can delay it as comfortable as you are. That's it. If you feel that you're not living up to your expectations of daily life, that's it. You have to have your surgery done. This is one, one thing. And the other thing, don't be afraid. You have to have questions. You have to, well, try to study as much as you can. Well, it's hard sometimes to understand everything, but you have to keep, well, talk to your surgeon, give him direct questions, and he, he will answer you gladly. doesn't matter. It's not only me. It's everyone should do so. So, and I hope everything is doing. Massive thank you, Dr. Lenas, for your time today. Um, always a pleasure because you are very, very uh, professional and respectful of others. You always show up on time, you do everything <laughs> we ask, even our silly um, It's not silly, so... Well. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, all right, so if you would like to hear more about hip or knee replacement, you can always send us a DM. We can uh, answer um, uh, about concrete prices and stuff and the process will take you literally from the airport to the surgery theater and back. So Wellness Travels is here to help you. And yeah, thank you, Dr. Lenas, again and just goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>